It is showtime, episode number six, a celebration of softball is coming up shortly. As always, I'm going to step back and ask you to help the show, my friends. I need your subscriptions. You just got to pause for one quick second. Bottom right corner, little red button says subscribe. It's totally free. You're not getting spammed. You are not paying a cent, but you're helping us immensely. We're building momentum with Next from the North. College coaches are starting to reach out to me on a daily basis. They are asking about the players in Next from the North. Every single time we get a subscription, we up the ante and we build the exposure and we give these kids a chance to head south for free. So subscribe to the channel, kick your feet up, enjoy three unbelievable athletes. Our celebration of softball starts right now. Friends, we are ready to roll with the bigger ball as this week we celebrate the beautiful game of softball. Three sensational athletes are standing by ready to share their stories and talk a little ball with Bex. What an exciting time it is in the world of softball as we are on the precipice of the return of this incredible game to the Summer Olympics. Halla freaking Luya. It is ridiculous, and I mean just plain stupid, that somehow it was ever removed from the games, for whatever reason. But I digress. It's back, and I, for one, couldn't be more excited to watch our amazing veteran Canadian team fight for a spot on the top of the podium. And as we look forward to Tokyo, I wanted to take this opportunity to shine the spotlight on some of the superstars that will don the Maple Leaf and go for gold this summer on the island of Japan. Our future guest of the week is the absolute leader of this group, and the captain is Victoria Hayward. She's a former first-team All-American for the Washington Huskies, and she's been with the team since she was sweet 16 back in 2009. Our pitching staff is widely regarded as the deepest in the tourney, They're led by fellow Husky legend Daniel Laurie, who is quite simply and arguably the greatest pitcher in NCAA history. In 2009, she won the first of back-to-back Player of the Year awards, the College World Series, and she went 42-8. and Yeah, 42-8. and And guess what? She had 521 Ks. Um... Yeah, that's a thing. 521 Ks. <laughs> what? Joining Danielle in the circle, former dominant Oregon Duck and friend of the show, Carissa Hovinga. Golden Gopher of Mini, Sarah Gronwagen. Syracuse Orange, multi-record holder, Jenna Kyra. And Oklahoma State legend, Lauren Bay Regula. And the newcomer, and our favorite, of course, why? Because she's from the YYC. She went to Austin, PA. She is, again, the newest member of the uh, pitching staff. Morgan Rackle rounds out what is an unbelievable pitching core group. They'll lead us, there's no question. They've done it for years, and pitching will continue to be a strong point as we head to Tokyo for this summer's Olympic Games. Pitchers are only as good as the receivers. That's uh, in baseball and softball, and it's no different with this incredible group. Canadian contingent has two of the very, very best. Florida State Seminole Kaylee Rafter is just one of the best to ever play the game. 
There's no question about it. She has handled the Canuck pitchers since 2007 and was part of the 2008 Olympic squad uh, that finished fourth and really outplayed themselves, and she was a huge part of that group as well. She is joined behind the dish by former Division II Catcher of the Year, Natalie Weidman. Needless to say, our chuckers are in very capable hands. The infield is stellar, to say the very least, led by another former national champion UW Husky, Jennifer Salling. Multi-record holder from Williams College and former guest of Talking Ball with Bex, Ms. Joey Lai. Ivy Leaguer from Brown, Janet Leung, former Wisconsin Badger, who absolutely raked at the Olympic qualifier, hitting a staggering 533, Kelsey Harshman. And maybe the best of the bunch, from San Jose State by way of Victoria, B.C., Emma Ensminger roll, <laughs> rounds out the infield group. Again, amazing in so many ways. The outfield might just be our biggest strength. I mean, really, really a big strength. Led by the aforementioned Victoria Hayward, Captain Victoria Hayward. Joined by Hilltopper of Western Kentucky, Larissa Franklin. Ball State Cardinal, Jennifer Gilbert. Center field superstar from Lindsey Wilson College, Callum Pilgrim. And former Oakland U Golden Grizzly legend, Erica Polidori. Can you see why I'm so excited about this group? Why, as a country, we need to get on board with this unbelievable veteran team? I will throw this out there right now. You heard it here first. Not only will this team improve on their fourth place finish from the Beijing Olympics, they will find their way to the top of the podium and bring home beautiful gold across the pond and back, back to the great white north. Now I am jacked. Three incredible athletes ready to rock, so let's get after it with Paige Simpson right now. You are talking ball with Bex from gap to gap and coast to coast. As always, our First feature of the day is our future star from Next from the North. This is our first delve into the softball world on the uh, future star segment, so very exciting times for us on the show. She has been a provincial champion, represented her zone at the Alberta Summer Games, and was picked up from the national championships as a 15-year-old. She is currently a member of the St. Joe's Softball Academy, and is the starting shortstop for the Red Deer Rage Travel Club. She is committed to play Division I college ball for the Broncos of Boise State University. It is my pleasure to welcome Paige Simpson to the show. Hello, Paige. How are things up in central Alberta? Oh, it's going pretty good. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. It's awesome to have you as our first uh, future softball star. So uh, lots to talk about. Let's get at it. Sound Mm -hmm. good? Yeah, sounds good. Excellent. Uh, Paige, I've been so interested to learn from uh, all of my guests how our elite athletes have managed this past year. You just told me off air that uh, you're back in a quarantine situation. Talk about the things you've done to stay sharp as possible this past year and uh, you know how you've managed COVID ball uh, again over this last year. Yeah, I've just been doing lots of stuff at home like you just got to get creative with everything, which is like, I'm fortunate enough to live on an acreage, so I can do stuff outside, and I got two brothers that I can play ball with. Actually, one's in Kansas right now, but but during like the April time, he was here, but yeah, it's just been like tough on everybody mentally too. It's just frustrating, like not being able to get those live at bats and like seeing ground balls off an actual bat. But I've just been, like, doing lifts at home because my dad actually built a squat rack for us in December, which was, like, I'm just really fortunate that he's, like, good with that stuff. But a bunch of T-work, just everything I can do possible just to 
try to stay on top of it. Yeah, you bet. Did you did you find something new that you'd never really tried before? Um, I don't know. I just been like even playing games outside, like blitz ball with my brothers. Just helped out with that. <laughs> I don't know. It was just anything, and uh, I would you just take the like brothers, my. Uh, Ball, ball's a big part of the family then? Oh, yeah. Like, our whole side of the family is big into ball. Same with my cousins. My grandma and grandpa come watch everything. Everybody's supporting that. Yeah, so it's really fun. Wow, that's awesome. Just, uh, it's so important to have that that close contact. And when, you're, when your family is interested in what you're interested in, it makes things certainly a lot easier in the, these tough times. How much have you missed the camaraderie of your teammates. I'm sure you're close with them. Uh, talk about sort of missing them and the, uh, the ability to get together and train together and, and just hang out, be, you know, be teenagers. Yeah. Like basically all my friends are from softball, so it's hard to not get like the bonding. And like, that's a big part of the sport, like being close with your teammates and bonding with them. But like the atmosphere, like just like getting, uh, to know all of them and like having competitive people with you to support you through that and just help you get better is a big part of it. So it's hard, but we've been staying in touch. It's just hard not to see them every day and I don't know, just get better as a team as a whole through that. So, yeah. What about online school page? Is that, uh, how's that adjustment been for you? Uh, I, it was really hard on me because I just like I like being and I'm a social person I like talking with my friends and I'm helping me out with school and it's just like I know you can still ask questions on like I still do but it's just not as easy as like oh hey teacher I got a question for you like in class and it's just hard with like self-discipline like staying in one spot and like staring at the computer screen all day and you're like oh when will this end and like I don't know. I like having a routine. Are you, so it was just really are hard. Are you driving your parents crazy? Oh, yeah. But they're teachers, too. So they were all five of oh, us geez. were using our our crappy country internet. So it's like I'm, like, getting knocked out of our Zoom meetings. And I'm like, sorry, <laughs> everybody's on the internet. So it was hard for that. <laughs> so far, so good yeah. on the interview. Uh, you're hanging in there with uh, with the internet. So hopefully I know. That I was kind of worried. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sure you're you're super excited to get back outside, uh, back to your teammates, and hopefully we get a season. At this point, we're not sure you'll get something, uh, whether or not it's travel or not. Um, at least there will be some some ball to be played. Uh, how's your team look? Are you excited about this group going into the season? If we get one, I am so excited for our, our team. We got like five girls down in the states and oh we're just like it's just like I'm just like egging on to play I just want to play with all of them because we're just I just I'm very excited for the season because everybody's just so talented and and a great group of girls but we haven't really got to practice together besides tryouts that was the only time but hopefully we got that going because we've already booked our Airbnb for Canada Cup like we're pretty we're just hopeful for that I don't know but I'm yeah, really excited no doubt. Yeah. where is that taking place Paige that's in Surrey uh BC so it's gotcha. uh, like I actually watched uh Sis Bates play down there like she was at that tournament she's uh the defensive player of the year for I think she's like two years in a row she plays on Washington um like okay. the Huskies and also mm -hmm. we got to watch Team Canada play and the junior national girls like it's a, it's a big tournament and yeah I'm really excited for that actually one one big memory from that tournament is our game got delayed so much that uh we ended up playing at like midnight and then we ended at 3 30 a.m because we went 11 innings and then we had a game at nine in the morning the next day <laughs> So Holy that man. was a, that was like my biggest memory from that. It was crazy. <clears throat> no doubt. Uh, we've had uh, fortunate enough to have three 
uh, the ladies from Team Canada on the show already, including later on in today's show, uh, the captain, Victoria Hayward, is is coming on the program. So <clears throat> exciting times for us and uh, cool that you were able to check out some of their action before. Paige, you've won a, a title before and uh, describe the experience of not only uh, winning at the provincial level, but going to nationals with your closest friends. I know it was down on the island and uh, it must have been just a great experience for you. Yeah. Oh, I just, I'm a competitive person. Like I, I always want to win, but that I remember the, the Sunday of the finals, we had to play four games in a row and it was just like the semifinals. It was insane because, uh, there was like a huge, everybody's like fighting over this one play that they were like arguing about. Cause our pitcher, like there was a bunt and she like faked through it to first and then got the girl out at home. And then we won the game from that, and everybody was like, no, she's safe. Anyway, and then we ended up winning that final, and it was just like, it was like everything we worked towards finally paid off, and we're like, we were so excited. But we always, I always knew we had it in us, but just to actually like finally win that gold, <laughs> crazy. But And then going to nationals, it was just like a fun time meeting all, like we actually like met some teams there, like, Quebec and we played some really high level ball there so yeah it was a really good experience yeah no doubt and and uh cool place to go to uh, the island is is gorgeous of course uh by comparison I know you were picked up by another team to go to nationals talk about that experience and how much different it is to be picked up by girls you don't necessarily know compared to going with a group of your best friends and how much different that was? Well, I was actually, I was like an underage. They picked me up, um, but it was like the rage program still picked me up. So I knew of some of those girls, but they were really like accepting and like I got along with them. So it was, that was really easy on me for that. But it was just like kind of intimidating because I'm like, oh, I'm so much younger than everybody. But like... It was just a big eye opener to see all like the really good competition. I'm like, whoa, like I'm two, three years younger than everybody and I'm competing with them. And I was playing short stuff there and like batting against uh, like the top pitchers in Canada, I guess. And I was like, holy crap, this is this is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What a great. What a great experience for for someone so young at the time. That's that's uh, it's really really cool to hear. Uh, you've also experienced the summer games. How much fun is an event that has lots of other sports going on? Not just your event, but the the chance to go out and see see some of the other sports, meet uh, you know kids from all over the province uh, doing all sorts of athletic things. How much fun was the summer games? That was yeah. That was one of my favorite moments of like for like opportunity wise because we would just like we meet the volleyball team basketball team uh we would go watch every sport um like cheering on our zone we're like oh this is like we're just making new friends all the time and it was just like really fun to see all like the different competition through that but and then they're they're coming our games cheering us on it was just really like i just like the support and everything is cool. Yeah, I'm sure uh, you hope for one day to get to the ultimate stage. Uh, you know, in Olympic Games, that would be certainly unbelievable with the same kind of aspects of cheering on other teams, other sports, and meeting people from all over the world would be unbelievable. What about social life, life page? Um, obviously, the past year, nobody's been very social. It's <laughs> kind of been shut down, of course, but... How do you protect against making sure softball doesn't become a chore and still remember to be a teenage girl once in a while? Yeah. Well, like, you got to have some balance through that because, like, obviously you need friends in life. But um, I still, like, I still make my own decisions. Like, at lunchtime, you can, like, I just try to balance it out. Uh, at lunchtime, I go up to the gym and work out instead of going out hanging out with my friends, uh, in their cars. I'm like, uh, I'll, I do that like once a week, just try to have some balance for that. But I work out four days a week up there 
and then the one day I'm like, okay, I'll hang out with you guys, but it is sure hard because uh, I'm just like a, before COVID, I was really busy with like, I would play basketball and volleyball and uh, just did all like the school sports, so I didn't really have much free time, but when I did, I like I made the most of it with my friends, had fun with them, but it was also, most of my friends are also on my softball team, so it's kind of like you get that with both of it. So, yeah. I was going to say, it's it's probably cool that most of your close friends are chasing the same sort of dream as you. And so a little bit easier to tell them, you know what, I can't hang out because I have to work out. And uh, certainly that's important to them as well. Um, you made a decision to join a year-round academy uh, situation that's obviously, obviously helped you out very well. Talk about the St. Joe's Academy, uh, the experience that you're going through up there. Uh, the, again, the ability to work out during your school day, uh, which makes it different from just you know regular playing of travel ball. Just talk about the St. Joe's Academy for a bit. Yeah, well, I just like I just get excited in the morning. I'm like, well, I get to do baseball every day, like or softball every day. So it's just like. It's like it's part of like I have we have four blocks so it's one of our blocks it's like a class basically but it doesn't feel like a class and the first year I went to St. Joe's I was like I was pretty nervous because I came from like really small towns and I'm like oh I'm going to Red Deer big school but like you basically like automatically have like 17 friends uh 17 girls that you can get along with and everybody like just striving for like the same Actually, not everybody's striving for the same goal. If they're just there to have fun and just improve even for their, like, club team, like, that's totally fine. And then there's some girls, like, trying to go down to college. Just the atmosphere, I just love it there. Everybody's everybody's on board. They're all uh, hyping each other up, getting better every day. I just, yeah, I really like it. I'll always praise that school. Yeah, we've had uh, Gavin Glenza on the show, and you know he speaks so very highly about the program as well. The coaching is is certainly amazing uh, at the academy, and it gives you certainly the opportunity to work out through the winter, which lots of Canadians don't have that opportunity. So that's pretty cool. Obviously, you have balanced it all very well, Paige, and now you've committed to an amazing school at Boise State University in Idaho. Tell us about the whole recruiting process, how it all came about, and ultimately how you decided to become a Bronco. Yeah, well, it was like usually your sophomore year is like your big year to get seen, but we didn't have a season. So I just really lucked out with like Jason Chatwood. He has a lot of connections, and I just basically give all credit to him for like finding that um but uh so he just like sent out my video like I was sending videos out to schools because I couldn't come watch me play but I was like we made a video and so I was just sending it out and he told me that he sent it to this uh Boise team and I was like oh like there's this one girl from Red Deer named Kelsey Lawler and she plays on there and I was like oh Kelsey Kelsey goes there right and then he's like yeah so I set up a FaceTime with her and talked to her about it, and she's like, yeah, it's, ama- it's an amazing school. Like, I love the coaches so much. Nothing. She didn't say anything bad about it. She was just hyping it up, and she was being honest with me. Like, I knew she wasn't going to lie to me about that. But And, like, a big thing for me is uh, coaches. Like, I, if I get along with my coaches, like, I'm going to have a good season. I, it's a really big part for me. And then... So they set up a call with me, and then he's like, he's like, yeah, I'd like to do a Zoom call with you and your family sometime. And then a couple of weeks later, we did that, and he just like did a PowerPoint, kind of showed me around, or just showed us what he did, or what they do at Boise, and it's a really like scenic place, which I it was like, it just kind of like reminded me of like just like down here. And, like, it kind of just, like, it's, like, a small town feel to it, they said, even though it's big, but it's, like, everybody, there's no, like, major sports teams in Idaho, so everybody's, like, for the college team. They're all wearing, like, Broncos merch, and it just, like, kind of, like, reminded me of, like, my roots. I'm, like, oh, 
like, I like the small town vibe, and I like everybody cheering for one thing, but, um, so after, like, the PowerPoint, he's, like, he gave me my offer, and then he's, like, I'll let you think about it, and then the next day I go to school, I'm, like, talking to Jason, I'm, like, it's perfect, like, I don't know, like, I have no regrets, and he's, like, well, call him up right now, and I was, like, okay, (laughs) so I went, I went to my car, and I had to drive to get service, and, because there's no service at our school, I don't know, and I was, like, hey, um, I'd like to take up on your offer and be a Bronco, and then they're really excited for me, so, yeah, it's just, I have no regrets, it's a perfect school, it's a perfect fit for me. It's, uh, yeah, I would say it's a big time program, you know, it's, it's division one college softball, a uh, huge football p- school as well. They're, uh, they're well, well, usually nationally ranked in the football rankings and, uh, you know, to be a part of that program, the athletic, uh, program at Boise state, it's a beautiful place. As you mentioned, uh, I couldn't be more excited for you. You must be so excited to start your college career. Have you been following the Broncos this year and checking out their results? Oh yeah, I've been keeping up with them and we had put we put their games on our like we somehow got it connected to our TV so I can watch their games from home. But I'm just excited to soon hopefully be able to f- fly down there and get a visit and maybe watch one of their football games hopefully cuz that's a big hype down there, like their blue turf, and apparently they do like this tailgating thing before, and it's like they show up like three hours before the game even starts, and they just like have a barbecue and just have fun, and then they sit in like the student section, and it's like the the stands are like packed full. And they're just like telling me about what they normally do for the recruiting process, but they're like, yeah, you'll get to do a visit, but when it <laughs> when it's allowed. <laughs> Yeah, it's that's awesome. So excited for you to experience the uh, the college life in America. I was fortunate enough to do it at a younger age too, and it, <clears throat> I wouldn't change it for the world. It's uh, it's amazing. You'll have lifetime friends that you create uh, on that team, and uh, hopefully, it'll be something that just sticks with you forever. Uh, later on this show, I mentioned that I have the the privilege of interviewing the captain of Team Canada for the Olympics this coming summer. Uh, Victoria Hayward is the national team something that you think about Paige and you know obviously you hope to make it someday but is it something that drives you forward thinking about playing for the national team yeah it's definitely a big goal of mine like now that I got achieved my goal of like div one that was a big goal for me um now it's like Olympics next or the national team but we haven't really there was supposed to be tryouts in the actually the spring I don't know if they're I think they got canceled, but I'm definitely working towards that. Like that, that's a big goal for me because I, f- I still follow them on like social media and it just seems like a really good time. Really fun group of girls too. Yeah. It's actually probably a really good time for someone your age because the, uh, it seems like the group that's there now have been together for 11, 12, some 13 years. And so it's a very veteran squad. And I would think after this Olympic experience, probably a few of them are going to move on to, you know, the next phases of their lives and certainly open up some spots for uh, girls like yourself, you know, at the age of just going into college and, you know, stepping up and potentially being part of that group going forward. Have you heard about Athletes Unlimited, Paige? And uh, if so, what are your thoughts about the possibility of maybe playing professional softball one day? It sounds so great, doesn't it? Yeah, that would be a, that would be a dream to make a living out of that, but I haven't really heard of Athletes Unlimited, but I don't know, yeah, so but it's a it's an organization that yeah. uh, Victoria started. Uh she was one of the first players involved. It started in 2019 and it has evolved into a uh just an unbelievable organization of women that play professional softball. Uh, volleyball is also, and now lacrosse is part of the program as well. So uh, it's a, it's out of the States, and it's um, it's something very, very special. And you should definitely look up Athletes Unlimited because uh, it's taking off. Absolutely incredible program, uh, giving women an opportunity to play professional softball, volleyball, and lacrosse. So yeah, it's very, very cool. 
Uh, last question and one I hope you're proud to answer. Uh, you know, I hate to pry, but at the end of the day, uh, the medical d- condition that you deal with on a daily basis uh, makes you a true inspiration to so many kids that struggle with different health issues and try to be great athletes at the same time. Uh, do you embrace the term inspiration uh, and just give us an idea of what you've had to overcome uh, with your medical issues and still trying to be an elite athlete? Yeah, like I definitely, I'm not ashamed of it or anything. Like I obviously can't help it, but it hasn't really, I've been fortunate enough, like it hasn't really affected me too much because it's only isolated in my jaw there. But so I, there hasn't really been much like I had to overcome just like maybe if I dive and it hurts or something, but I definitely like try to, I did like an interview, um, for, it was the nationals in Calgary and they were like, uh, I think the arthritis foundation was, um, a sponsor and they wanted me to do an interview and just inspire other girls to keep pushing through if they got something that they're struggling with. But so I did an interview for that and it was, no, I definitely embrace it. Like nothing I can help. Yeah. Really, yeah no, it's yeah. it's important, right? Because there are there are other kids that have all kinds of different medical issues, and mm-hmm. uh, at, at sometimes they feel like they just want to give up and don't want to to work towards the I goal. Know. So it's yeah. fantastic that you embrace it and uh, that you're willing to to be that kind of beacon for other kids that you know certainly want to succeed yeah. and and overcome medical issues for sure. So. Uh, I congratulate mm-hmm. you for that, Paige. I congratulate you on your commitment to play D1 softball. It's such an incredible uh, institution, yeah. Boise State University. Um, it has been awesome having you as our first future softball star on the program. Uh, thank you so much for stopping by, Paige. Uh, and I wish you an unbelievable 2021 and beyond. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was awesome. Awesome. It was a pleasure. You take care, Paige. Thank you. You too. Yeah, see ya. Oh, my. What a truly special young lady uh, that one is. Paige Simpson, our thanks to her for stopping by. Truly great things on the horizon for her, including a trip to D1 Boise State University. We'll be right back with another incredible guest. Uh, Ryan Milliken of the Utah Valley Wolverines is standing by next. And we'll be right back after this. I'll take a quick second to talk to you about Area Scouts and the unbelievable platform that this is. Next week, we have an incredibly special show as we launch Area Scouts Canada. We are searching for evaluators all over this country, an opportunity for coaches to make the kind of money that they deserve for helping kids become better athletes. Everything Area Scouts is special. We take care of kids with injury prevention, proper movement, biomechanics, athleticism, and some of the directors include household names Fred McGriff, Ryan Lavarnaway, Brandon Geyer, Anthony Anzillo, Joey Lai, Carissa Hovinga, Alyssa Reina. The list goes on and on and on. It's next week on Talking Ball with Bex, the launch, Area Scouts Canada. So don't you dare miss it next Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern and 3 in the mountains. You're talking ball with Bex from Gap to Gap and Coast to Coast. Our next guest is our first active D1 athlete. So we are very excited that she has taken a minute to hang with Bex and talk a little ball. She is currently a junior at D1 Utah Valley University where she's hitting a stellar 379. She got three doubles and four bombs. For her D1 career, she has hit just a couple points under 400. Yeah, you heard right, 400. Before she was a Wolverine, she had a stellar sophomore season at D1 Juco. Grayson College hitting 324 with five long balls and 34 ribbies. Everywhere she's gone, she has raked. <clears throat> and there's no question, she has a great chance to be an All-American in her senior season. 
From there, the sky is the absolute limit for Rianne Milliken. For now, she's here with us on Talking Ball with Bex. We couldn't be more excited about it, so welcome, Rianne. Thanks so much for stopping by. How are things down in Utah? Uh, they're good, but my name pronounced is actually Ryan. It's really oh, weird. I'm so sorry. But that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, it's, it's good here. I mean, it's definitely different. There was a culture shock coming from Victoria to Texas and now to Utah, but I've enjoyed myself, you know been a good yeah. time good it's yeah. so great to have you on the show ryan i apologize <laughs> that's uh, okay especially, you can blame my parents uh, for that <laughs> especially since it's game day against in-state crosstown rival byu how did the game go um it was good we actually had we were supposed to play at six we had an hour delay for rain and thunderstorms so it was oh, kind geez. of a bummer but i mean we hit well they hit better <laughs> Can't really do anything about it, but um, I'm looking forward to this weekend because we have an upcoming series uh, for our WAC conference against Dixie State, who's also uh, D1 in Utah. So hopefully we can get a sweep or a couple wins in there. We definitely need some more wins to get us going. So, but no, I'm excited. That's good. Um, might as well expand on 21 since we're talking about it now. Uh, obviously, personally, you've been swinging it well and having a good season at the plate. What about the team? Has, uh, have you sort of lived up to expectations or what were the expectations for this group going into 21? Uh, so we had a really good year last year and then unfortunately COVID came and, you know, cut it off. We Our winning percentage was like six something, like we were killing it. And then, you know, COVID came and we thought we were going to start off really strong. I mean, it didn't go as planned, but I think um, our offense has definitely come to the plate in the past couple games and series. So I think it's a bright future for us. I mean, we had a bit of a rocky start, but um, it's definitely looking better and looking good. So I'm excited. Yeah, awesome. Um, you were coming off an unreal 2019 when you joined the squad last year. Uh, you clearly were raked. You you were excited uh, to start your university career. How tough was it uh, as, you know, the, the season cut short and really the unknown of whether you were going to have a season going forward at all uh, or if it was just going to get completely shut down? Just talk about how you dealt with it mentally and physically and how you stayed sharp over the COVID year. Well, for us at Utah Valley especially, we actually, so I got recruited by a coach um, who knew my JUCO coach, and he was here for a semester, so I came in as he was going to be my coach, and then he actually left. So not only did we have a COVID year, but we had a whole transition of the team, um, both on and off the field, because we had a new coach coming in. So in the fall, um, we left not having a coach. So we didn't know what to expect in January coming in. Like we had no idea what was going to happen. We didn't know if our assistant coaches were going to just step up for interim. Um, like we had no idea. And then luckily we had this amazing coach come in, Stacey Mae Johnson, and she's an all American MVP of the um, American national team, like has had an amazing career. So we were very lucky to have her come. Um, and with COVID, uh, I, I don't know. It was weird because we didn't even start WAC play. We didn't start a conference. So we just, we went to Mexico actually and played a couple of good teams there, came back ready to practice. We had a home game coming up. Then we were at practice, got the phone call. We had a team meeting, stop practice like right then. And they told us like, we can't practice anymore. Uh, we don't know what's going on. It was right around spring break. So it was either, okay, we're going to go home for two weeks, come back, maybe it'll be done, you know. Then we are off for two weeks and we're not coming back. And then we're leaving to go home and we don't know when we're going to come back. So it was definitely hard mentally, like with the unknown, you know. It's hard not knowing what's happening, like what, what the future holds, you know. But I think it was almost like a refresher, you know. It was you know, go back into the cages, get your work done in and out, a lot of individual work. I mean, you have to stay on top of it by yourself because there's no team practice. There's nothing. Everyone's going home. I mean, I'm the only international uh, kid on my team, but we have girls from California, girls from Texas, Missouri, 
you know, there was no team practice plan. It was kind of, you know, you're on your own. You got to be responsible for keeping your work up. And for me, it was actually not that hard because I have a lot of different spaces I can go to at home and a lot of people are there to help. So I was one of the lucky ones, but I know there were some people who didn't have anything. Like they went home and, you know, they had to play catch with their parents outside or they had to pitch to a, a, a fence, you know, like there wasn't a lot. So I was lucky for sure. I was definitely lucky because I had a support system back home that I could go hit in cages. I could go, you know, take ground balls from even my younger sister, her team, you know, so I was lucky, but definitely was hard. Definitely yeah, was one hard. of the things I think covid did is separate the the uh, the hard workers from the ones that generally skate by on talent because for sure as you said there was very little team activities across north america um and at the same time you had to put the work in on your own and therefore the ones that did have come out of this swinging it very well like mm-hmm. you like yourself and it's kind of different that you know, something so terrible has actually separated the cream of the crop. And it's uh, it's interesting how that's played out for sure. Yeah, it's definitely one of those real-life situations, though. I mean, you have a lot of those um, when you're away from home and you kind of have to navigate on your own. And, I mean, that's what's going to happen in real life. You can't skate by, you know. You got to put your work in. So it kind of, I think it made people grow up a little bit faster, too, you know. Yeah, it's like very, you have very, your, you got to be, re- you got to be responsible for yourself. For sure. Very good yeah. point. Um, let's go back to your JUCO years, Ryan. Uh, first Galveston, Texas, a long way from Victoria, BC, obviously. <laughs> yep. Tell us about the process of getting recruited so far away uh, by, you know, an, an outstanding JUCO and eventually landing at Galveston College. So, yeah, I've had a crazy four years. Like I've been through the ringer. So, <laughs> I was in high school at Lambrick, you know, and we have a very good baseball, softball program there. And luckily enough, I had Rocky Vitale, um, who was my coach throughout high school and travel ball and everything. And so he got me, he has many connections, right? So there was a girl who was two years older than me. She went to Galveston. Um, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I didn't know if I wanted to go straight to a four year, you know, go to a university, go to a JUCO. Like I had no idea. So she said she really liked it at Galveston. So I was like, you know what? Why not? I love Texas. Um, My parents have lived there before. You know, my dad played professional hockey down in the States. So they were like, go to Texas. You'll love it. And I was like, okay, I'm going. It was a very quick decision. Like, I think it happened over a weekend. Like, it was that fast. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. Whatever. So I go there. I go to Texas. Everything works out. Went on my visit. It was awesome. I loved the coach. So we get down there, my parents come, my sister comes, and Hurricane Harvey happened. So me, freshman year, coming out of high school, first time I'm going to be away from my parents, I get to Galveston. I'm so excited, moving into my dorms. Um, I'm getting all settled in, unpacking my stuff, and then we get a phone call saying Galveston Island is getting evacuated. And mind you, this is like my first day in Texas. Good Lord. So I'm like, well, my parents are here. They're staying in a hotel on the island. Like, what do we do? So uh, it's like nine or 10 o'clock at night. And I'm like, okay, guys, like, I guess this is goodbye. Like, I'm saying goodbye to my parents the first day they're there, the first day I'm there. They're like, we need to get on a plane. We need to get out of here. We don't want to be stuck. I'm evacuated to a girl's house I've never met before. And I'm like, wow, this is college. Like, this is what's happening. I have 24 hours and I'm already like going through it. So yeah, that was, that was pretty crazy. I mean, that's how my college life started was a category five hurricane. But I mean, it was pretty cool. I mean, looking back on it, it was in the moment I was scared and you know, my parents left and I was like, what do I do? (laughs) But I mean, looking back, I'm like, wow, I got to say I was in a hurricane. But I mean, after that, was there any thought they might take you with with them? <laughs> uh, no, my parents were like, you know what? You're safe. You know, you're you're evacuated in a good area. They're like, we got to get out of here. My, I think my my mom really wanted to leave. My dad was like trying to watch the storm. He was like, this is so cool. Like, <laughs> yeah, my parents, yeah, they got out of there. I mean, I don't blame them. I didn't want to be stuck there for two weeks in the hotel either. But oh, no, no, after that, it was pretty much smooth sailings. 
but it was pretty crazy. <laughs> so you you had a solid freshman season, but decided yeah. <laughs> to transfer. Uh, what factors yes. drove the decision to leave Galveston and head to Grayson? Yeah. So I mean, there was a lot of a lot of variables that you know, came into play to transfer. I mean, I didn't plan on transferring, um, but there's a lot of stuff in the background that I just didn't really enjoy um, outside of softball. So, I mean, I don't want to talk bad on them, but there's just a lot of stuff going on. And um, I had three girls transfer from, or not transfer, but come from my same high school to Galveston. They kind of came to like follow. And I was so excited for them to come. And, you know, it, it just didn't really work out. It wasn't a good fit. And uh, we had a coaching change uh, once again, it seems to happen to me every year, coaching change. Um, and then the new coach, I just wasn't really a good fit, you know. And, you know, I tried to stay. You know, I'm very much of a, you know, you're going to go through things in your life you're not going to like, but you got to just persevere and go through it, right? And I was trying, I was trying, I was trying. I was like, this just, I'm not enjoying myself at all, you know. So then that's what made me transfer to Grayson which I was very happy about, like best, one of the best decisions I've made. Yeah, I was going to say, obviously, it was a tremendous decision because as your uh, sophomore campaign was awesome, uh, not only individually, but your Grace and team qualified for D1 JUCO Nationals. So talk about that experience, uh, your first trip to a the huge national event um, and uh, representing your college and you obviously raking throughout your sophomore year as well. It must have been just an awesome season all around. That was probably my favorite, one of my, like, if not this year, it's been fun, but that Grayson team was one of the best teams I've ever played on. Like, we were just having fun. We were winning. We were all hitting bombs. Like, it was awesome. It was such a good environment. I love Coach LeBrayer. Like, he's one of the best coaches I've ever had, and I will – talk to him for the rest of my life like he's one of those people who will just you meet and he impacts you and that's what I felt there it was just awesome like you know you're having fun you're playing well you're in college with your friends like oh it was awesome and you know we had a really good team we all hit well like oh, if I could go back and have another year at Grayson I so would and this year like I still follow them and they are destroying it you know, That's it's just awesome. an awesome program. That is so cool. <clears throat> and uh, lifelong friends you made and, and memories you'll never forget. For sure. Obviously. Um, that season led you to your current home, which is a gorgeous part of the country. Talk about the steps that led to Utah Valley U. Yeah. So that was, again, it's all about connection. So my head coach at uh, Grayson knew the head coach at Utah Valley and you know, he was talking to uh, McBrayer over the course of the season um, at Grayson. It was just saying, like, he had an interest in me, you know, and I was like, oh, okay, like, I don't really know. I've never, you know, been to Utah before. I don't know where I want to go, what I want to do. Um, I was just because I was just enjoying myself. I wasn't really thinking about, um, you know, where I'm going to transfer. I just kind of had tunnel vision on the season. So, um, I talked to uh, Coach TJ, who was the coach here when I got recruited, and, you know, I really liked him. He was an awesome guy. Um, we got along really well. He got along with my family really well, and it just seemed like a really good fit. And then I came on my visit here to Utah, and I kind of just fell in love. Like, it's beautiful here. The mountains, like, so, like so pretty. Everything looks like a background. Like, it's just amazing. And... So I just, I came on my visit and I was like, wow, I love this place. Like the campus is beautiful. It feels nice. Like, I mean, I can hike mountains if I want to, like there's so many activities here. So yeah, when I came on a visit, I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to come here. And another factor that um, was huge was um, a girl from uh, one of my friends from Grayson came on the visit with me because she was interested in coming here too. So I was like, well, you know, if you're going to go, I'm going to go, you know, it was kind of one of those things. Like we're either we're doing this together. So yeah, we kind of both were like, you know what, like, let's do it. So then we both decided we're going to come here and it was awesome. And now we're still roommates and it's our second year here. 
Oh man, what a what a great story! Just uh, clearly, the decision to leave Texas, despite the fact that uh, some of your older friends had joined you, just turned out to be an amazing thing and work out for the very best. And at the end of the day, you know, everything happens for a reason. Is that right? For sure. For sure. Absolutely. Um, Ryan, we we represent young Canadian, young aspiring Canadian ball players. Uh, speak about you know the young days in Victoria, sort of the the preparedness, the steps you took, the the work you put in to to play at the next level. Give us an insight as to how much you had to do and sacrifice as far as social life, you know, and friendships and stuff, just to make it where you've made it. Obviously, yeah, for sure. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. Um, I remember in high school, I used to get really upset because I felt like I'd missed out on a lot, you know, looking back on it now, I'm like, you're not missing out on anything. But you know, in the moment when you're in high school and have all your friends and you want to do all these things, you know, I remember one time specifically, I was, I got picked up for, for a team in Vancouver to go on a tournament in Texas. And it was my senior year and um i was missing like the halloween dance or something like something that did not matter at all but i remember i was distraught i was like oh, i'm missing out on all these things because i'm the only one in my friend group who's like traveling and going on these ball tournaments and like always at practice and always at games you know and i'm always i always felt like i was away and looking back on it i'm like you have to do those things if you want to get to the next level you have to do better than you have to put more work in to decide like put the person beside you you know if they're working 100 100 balls or 100 reps you got to do 150 200 you know it's just stuff like that and you know i know when you're there in high school and you're with your friends and you're you feel like you're missing out on things you're not because in the end you're going to be the one who's you know destroying softballs when you're in college not you know, still at home having to work and go to school. So that's <laughs> yeah. a, that's, that's a big thing. And, you know, um, other things just like, don't be afraid to put in extra work and don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, that's something that I've, I'm a very talkative person. Um, that's something I've never struggled with. I'm always asking questions. You know, if I think something's off or I don't quite get something, I'm not afraid to be like, Hey, I don't get this. Or can you explain this, you know, go into it, go explain it more. Um, but yeah, and it's, you know, it's just, you're, you're not missing out on things. Even if you think you are, you're not, because you're going to look back and you're going to be like, I don't even remember missing out on a Halloween dance. Um, it's amazing perspective, yeah. uh, Ryan, for sure, because <clears throat> there are, you know, just thousands of athletes all over North America growing up thinking those exact thoughts that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. but to give them the, the the perspective that guess what the things that happen to you in college and beyond are so much more important than oh, a high yeah. school dance you missed. Oh, or, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, and um, actually, when I was in uh, high school in grade ten, I played for a team that wasn't where I lived, so I played on the team in White Rock, and I remember having to go to practice every weekend taking the ferry, taking the 9 a.m. ferry in the morning, taking the 3 o'clock ferry back. And I was like, oh, like, why am I – in the moment, I was like, why am I doing this? Like, I feel like I'm missing out on so many things. And now I'm like, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't be where I am today, yeah, you know? Absolutely. <clears throat> and I, another big thing for me, which I didn't realize until I actually got to college, was um, being coachable, you know? It's – really important to be coachable and understand that you know you're maybe where you live right now you're a big fish in a little pond but once you go somewhere else like you got to understand that there's 30 kids that are just as good as you and talent at the end of the day isn't going to be the thing that makes you play it's going to be your attitude the way you work you know how you are at practice how you are when you strike out you know and I've learned that the hard way I remember when I was younger, I used to get so mad at myself and it would be shown on my face. Like, I remember I went to the Little League World Series and <laughs> there's a video of me striking out and throwing my bat and I would just get so worked up. And that's such a big thing is your attitude. Like, you can't wear your emotions on your face. 
you know, you got to be coachable. You got to adapt to where you are. Um, and I've learned that just from having all these different coaches and even in the past four years. And I think that for me, I learned the most because that's what I've had to grow up and do, you know? And I think a lot of kids um, who are younger and in high school, I mean, they think it's the end of the world if you strike out or you make an error, you know, but it's so important the way you handle yourself. And that's going to, you know, if, when coaches come and watch you, they're going to pick you out for your bad attitude. If you have one, they're not going to pick you out for hitting a home run, you know? So I think that's super important to understand because it's such a, it's such a big thing. And at the end of the day, yeah, you're playing softball, you're playing baseball or whatever sport you're playing, but it's only going to last so long. You know, having a good character is more important than having a meltdown if you strike out. Wow, that That is <laughs> so. amazing. Absolutely. That, uh, just great, great stuff, Ryan. It's awesome to hear somebody young who truly gets it. Um, clearly yeah. you had some influences. Talk about who your biggest influences were in the young days. Uh, and how much they impacted your life. So I have a couple, actually. Um, so Rocky Vitale is one of them for sure. He was my uh, high school coach, um, travel ball, you know, in Can in Canada or Victoria for in specific. Uh, we didn't have high school softball, um, which like a lot of the American people do, or I guess every American does. Um, but so we just had travel ball, and I was lucky enough at Lambrick, we got to do softball during school, but I definitely would not be where I am today without him. Um, he has helped me through so much, made me grow as a player, as a person. Um, and I have a really close relationship with him. Like my family and him are very close to um, my younger sister now plays for him. Uh, so he was really a big part. And then uh, my coach McBrayer at Grayson, he was huge. Like, he's someone who's going to impact the rest of my life. You know, you just have, you, everyone has the one coach or a couple coaches that, you know, you're always going to remember them. And he was awesome. And I wouldn't be in Utah if it wasn't for him either. Um, but no, he's a great guy. And then uh, lastly, my dad, I mean, he is someone who taught me from a very young age to be competitive, um, to not be afraid to be a strong person, have a strong personality. Um, that definitely got me in trouble a couple times, but I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I have that personality. Um, but yeah, no, I'm learning from him because he was a big person to kind of talk me down from things because um, he played professional hockey uh, in the States and he left his house when he was 14 to go on to the next level. So he kind of had that experience and he, you know, maybe I didn't listen all the time to what he had to say, but, you know, looking back on it now, I probably should have listened earlier, but, you know, it, having someone that was an athlete in high school, knew about the feeling of missing out on things, uh, leaving home at a young age, like he's someone that I always call, you know, have a bad game. He'll text me. Oh, that's a tough one. You know, you'll get the next one. Um, and I think having someone that is in your corner all the time is so important because you know softball and baseball especially it's a game of failure you know you're gonna have tough days you're gonna have amazing days but you gotta understand like how to balance it all out um how to be mentally tough and like not get super down on yourself but also understand what you did wrong it's it's so hard i honestly think softball and baseball are one of the most mentally tough games you can play and it is so important to understand how to balance the mental toughness because I think it's physically exhausting, but the mental aspect of the game is so important. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. And you actually answered the question I was going to ask next about having a professional athlete in your family and being able to yeah. follow in his footsteps. And clearly that had an amazing impact on you and certainly from the mental side and, and, probably from the competitive side too, just oh, the fact for sure. that he had to battle as long as he did, uh, you know, passed it along to you. And now on to your younger sister too, which is fantastic mm -hmm. to hear. Do you remember, Ryan, when you knew uh, that softball was it and that that was going to be your future, that was going to be your goal? Was there a moment that just said, bam, this is me, this is what I'm doing? Um, I don't know if there's a moment, but um, I used to play hockey 
my dad made me play hockey actually <laughs> um that's one of the competitive sides i got because he actually wouldn't let me play with the girls i had to be on a, a boys team so <laughs> and then i was like you know what i can't play hockey with the boys anymore i can't do it they're growing i'm not they're bigger and stronger than i am it's not not fun anymore so then i was like hmm, what can i play and i was like softball i might as well play softball and my grandma actually was a very good softball pitcher um back in her days you know they didn't have the d1 they didn't have you know the resources we have now but i'm sure if they did she would have been like at ou or something some big school because she was really good and then you know my dad played slow pitch and stuff and i used to always watch and i was like huh, i kind of want to play softball you know so then i started playing and i was kind of late late to the game um i probably started when i was like 12 or 13 you know and then, you know, I started playing and I started decided that, wow, hitting the ball is really fun, you know, like, I want to see how far I can hit it. So then I kept just, you know, practicing. Uh, you remember, I used to set up a net and a tee outside, like on my own and just hit balls off the tee. And I think that's when I knew, because I was like, I actually want to practice more than I have to practice. Like, this is weird, you know, um, and then... I just kind of got good. I started playing and I started playing with girls older than me. And um, I played on a really good travel ball team and I just had fun doing it. You know, I was at home and I wanted to be playing softball. You know, I was in bed watching TV or something and I wanted to be taking swings off the tee. So that's when I think I knew like, wow, I really do like playing. That's really cool. <clears throat> and obviously it was a very good choice to leave boys hockey and get into a <laughs> Yeah, that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, speaking of professionals, um, have you heard about Athletes Unlimited, Ryan? And uh, if so, you know, is that something that may be on the horizon for you in the future? It's, it's, I've had the pleasure of interviewing uh, Victoria Hayward, uh, Joey Lai, Carissa Hovinga, they're all part of Athletes Unlimited, and they speak just incredibly about this program, this professional softball, volleyball, and now lacrosse uh, program at Athletes Unlimited. Is it something you've heard about and checked into? Yeah, it's something I heard about because um, Emma Ensminger, who's actually from Victoria, she's on the national team, K national softball team. Uh, she plays with them, and um, I follow her on social media and everything, and um we actually talked about hitting during covid and stuff hitting together because she's a local girl and all of us have looked up to her um but yeah i mean i've thought i've i know about it i've never really thought about it i don't know if i'm quite at that point to uh get into the professional level i mean it would be a crazy good opportunity but i mean i think it's awesome how uh softball is getting this um you know professional side because i think it deserves to have you know um more of a i don't even know how to explain it just i feel like it needs to be known more you know like we need a bigger platform and i think that athletes unlimited is giving it that platform that it needs so no i think that's awesome uh i i watched a couple of the games um when uh whenever they were playing and it's so cool seeing girls that you've looked up to or watched like playing against each other. Like, Oh, it was so cool. Yeah. It's, you know what the, the entire sport for sure needs the exposure that uh, athletes unlimited is giving it. Uh, oh, it's sure. so amazing that it's back in the Olympics because yeah. it should never have left the Olympics in my mind. Mm -hmm. And, um, we in Canada get so little coverage of softball. And I know down, down there, ESPN does such a great job covering uh, regionals and NCAAs. Yeah. And, and it's just so exciting uh, to watch that game. And I, and I wish we could get more of it up here. But with the Olympics upcoming, uh, one more great question to talk about. Um, the guest following you, I mentioned, is the captain of the current Olympic Team Canada. Uh, Victoria Hayward. First of all, how excited are you to see softball back in the Olympics this summer? And also, potentially, is it something that drives you with the possibility of one day putting on Team Canada's jersey and representing our country at the highest level? Oh, I'm so excited. I've watched these. I remember going to tournaments in Vancouver and watching um, Team Canada play when I was 
like 14, 15. And all of those girls are going to be in the Olympics now. I think it's awesome. And especially Emma Ensminger, like having a girl from her hometown, having someone I went to high school with and have watched played every weekend growing up. Like, I think it's amazing, like getting to watch her on TV representing our country. Um, and no, I mean, that's always been a goal of mine or, you know, something in the future to be able to wear, you know, the red and white jersey, have the maple leaf on my chest, you know. Um, and I hope that I get the opportunity to do that. But I just think it's awesome how um, I can see girls that I know, you know, be at that level and watch them succeed and just do what they love to do. Um, and I really, I think they'll do well. I think they're a pretty good team. So, I mean, I hope yeah. so. Yeah, they're yeah. a veteran squad that have been together yeah. for a very long time, and the chemistry seems to be just over the top. Um, yeah. For everything I'm seeing in this interview, Ryan, uh, I think obviously there's going to come a point where you get an opportunity to to put that I jersey so. on because <laughs> man, you just you just you just seem to get it. You you clearly have the right path. You have the right mindset. Um, your work ethic and all the things that you've talked about in this episode has been just awesome to meet you. I'm so happy you came on this show and uh, I thank you very much for stopping by. I wish you an unbelievable rest of your season and hopefully you guys turn it up just in time to, to get on a little bit into the postseason as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. It's totally <laughs> awesome. <Cheers. laughs> awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Take care. Is there any question at all that that young lady is on her way to greatness? What an incredible interview with someone so young and uh, clearly so together as a human being, as an athlete, uh, as a progressive young lady that is truly destined for greatness. Our thanks to Ryan Milliken for stopping by. Uh, it was, again, just an unbelievable chat, and hopefully we'll catch up with her somewhere down the line. I can almost guarantee it'll be once she makes Team Canada and eventually uh, the professional organization, Athletes Unlimited. Thanks, Ryan. We'll uh, hopefully see you soon, and uh, we'll be right back after this. Did I mention the momentum we're feeling at Next from the North? This platform, created by yours truly, as a free recruiting website for Canadian projectable ball players to get noticed now. Did I mention it's free? You bet it is. They log on, they fill out a questionnaire, they hit submit, and they are in. Guess what? Coaches are now starting to recognize the momentum builds daily. They're reaching out to me via Twitter. They're reaching out to me via Facebook. They are asking, what players do I have and where can they find them? So it's as simple as this. Log on to Bexy.com, scroll down to Next From The North, and click the Get Notice Now button. Fill out the questionnaire, hit submit, you're in, and you are on your way to a great future south of the border. It's Next From The North, it's Bexy.com, and let's get back to the show with another incredible guest. You're talking ball with Bex from Gap to Gap and Coast to Coast, it is once again time for our feature guest of the week. Last week, I told you that somehow we keep stepping up our game with regards to our guests. And this week, we have absolutely outdone ourselves. Not only is she the captain and leader of our Canadian Olympic softball team, she was the youngest athlete in history to be selected to our senior national team. Twice, she has won Pan Am silver, three times World Cup bronze, and she was a first-team All-American at Pac-12 Powerhouse UW. She was also named All-Conference all four years she was there, and she is the first player to sign with the prestigious Athletes Unlimited, which I can't wait to talk about later. I honestly can't believe she's here, but she is, so let's do this. Victoria Hayward, welcome to Talking Ball with Bex. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you for stopping <laughs> Thank by. Thank you. Thank you for the intro. Thanks for the opportunity, Bex. Super excited to talk ball and share a little bit about my story with you. Awesome. Absolutely. I know you are right in the middle of a uh, massive training schedule for 
just the Tokyo Summer Games, nothing more than that, um, but uh, lots to talk about. So let's get after it. And uh, here, obvious start is currently you are training with the team finally. I know it's been a long and tough year, but you're actually together with the group and uh, all of us want to know, how are we looking? How's the squad? The squad is great. Uh, we're in Fort Myers right now. We've been here for um, almost a month, so ju just over three weeks training every day outside on the field. Uh, we have a great complex. The Lee County, the, the county here has been incredibly supportive of us. Have a few games under our belt now, um, but it's hot. We're training. We're preparing for that Tokyo heat, and um, it's awesome just to be back on the field together for – better than we've ever been that's 100 percent um and we're just getting better every day it's, it's been really great to just be together for a long period of time and just know that we can kind of keep building on the things we've been working on individually for so long it's interesting that you meant to uh, mention that you're better than ever uh, you have been with this group, and in fact, the whole group has been together for uh, an incredible amount of time for an international contingent. Um, how is this team different now than, say, early on in your uh, your history with the Olympic team? Um, and, and, you know, are you ready to step atop the podium? Of course you are, but what makes this group capable as maybe in past you weren't? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, obviously, with the Olympics, on the horizon and um, there's just a different level of investment across the board. I mean, in my own career, it was constantly balancing other jobs, other priorities, whether it was school at UW or um, coaching careers or just kind of balancing that work life balance. And now um, every single person on our team is 100% all in to our mission and, and getting better at it every single day. So there are really no distractions. It's all about the team. It's all about how we're getting better and how um, we're putting all of the pieces together. So I think the want and the drive has always been there, but I think now we really have the resources and the opportunity to all be one, all be professional athletes and, and really live up to that expectation of doing it every single day. So um, the strides we've seen from that, just people putting their lives on hold, putting their fam leaving their families at home to come and just make softball their number one priority. We've seen so many strides just um, both on and off the field for us as a group. Yeah, one of the things I love most about the Olympic Games is brings out the casual fan, uh, not the people that would normally watch softball or any other sport for that matter. Um, for those people, give us an idea of some of the names to look for on Team Canada. Uh, again, you guys have been together for a very long time, and lots of us know the names. But for the casual guys, uh, who are we looking to watch uh, when we tune in for the softball at the Olympics? Oh, man. Um, I mean, I think we're, we're definitely led. We have an awesome pitching staff. We think we have the deepest pitching staff of any team at the Olympics. So um we haven't we don't have a team named yet so it, it's hard to give you all of the secret sauce because we're still in a little bit of a tryout process here but um I mean Danielle Laurie Lauren Bay are two of our veteran pitchers Sarah Grunwagen is um doing really well for us on the mound um our left side of our infield all of our infielders are, are super young and um are just at the beginnings of, of figuring out who they are as players and it's pretty incredible but I couldn't say enough about Emma Ensminger Janet Leung, Kelsey Jenkins, and um, and everything they've been able to do. Obviously, Kaylee Rafter is a staple. She's been uh, Team Canada's kind of heart and soul for a number of years. But um, it's really going to take all of us, and that's the cool thing. I think um, people will fall in love with our team as a whole. There's no one superstar that's going to carry it to the end. It's just really about all of us working together, which makes the journey so fun. When you talk about uh, young players and, and some of the younger core, um, how much of a leadership role do you take upon yourself, Victoria, and, and you know some of the other veteran players on the team um, sort of guiding those young players through this process? Because it's very exciting and actually new for you as well with the Olympic Games on the horizon. Um, again, how do you take it upon yourself to lead the young core? Yeah, I mean, I think that you you spoke it right there there's definitely a challenge of leading place leading people to a place you've also never been so um it's something i'm constantly working on and and trying to navigate um i rely on we have four people that have been there and i rely on them immensely um and just try to put myself in a position to where 
I can I can just help them through their their early years just as I was helped through my years. I think um, we want to leave the program better than we found it. I want people to have a better experience than I did in my first years on the team. And um, I feel like we're doing that through our team culture. We have an amazing team culture. Um, our team, we all really care about one another and are kind of willing to do whatever it takes. So um, I tried to lead by example, share my experiences and just be a resource to them. But for the most part, our team is now leading themselves, which is pretty special. It's not leading and following. It's just kind of helping establish a direction and then going together. Probably the toughest uh, leadership role you had to take was over this last year. And <clears throat> obviously it was a, an extremely difficult roller coaster ride of emotions. You train your whole life to go to the Olympic summer games. They're on again, they're off again. They're, there's so much trepidation about whether or not you're actually going to be able to play. Um, and <clears throat> I'm sure the young core were, were even more anxious about this whole process. I'm so interested because I, I asked Joey Lai and Carissa, uh, you know, their perspective and the team perspective was obviously that of protect first, um, win later. And I'm curious about you and uh, your own personal um, involvement with this year and how you navigated through COVID and uh, the Olympics being on again, off again? Yeah, I mean, I I really struggled with it. Um, I I think Joey, I mean, to have just the perspective that they had in those moments is really special. I wish I had that perspective in those moments. I think um, I, I took it very very hard not not knowing the future i think it's it's been 13 years of this and i felt like i had poured my heart and soul into it so just to feel like um it was taken away and just we were back into that piece of uncertainty and it just leads you to question kind of what am i still doing playing the game if 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 it can just be taken away like that and so i think it really challenged me to think about why i love doing what i'm doing what my what my bigger purpose is because if I was just playing to go to say that I went to the Olympics, that wasn't enough because it was proven I could be taken away. So that, that part of last year just really challenged me on what, what my goals were for myself, who I wanted to be, what I wanted to leave behind. And I think um, that really motivated me to be extra involved with Athletes Unlimited and, and just trying to create something bigger and leave things better and um, try to leave my mark on the sport that's giving given me so much so that was truly a light of just pouring myself into something different that was positive that we we knew we knew was going to happen we we did we had COVID protocols in line and a little bit more time to plan with a much smaller group than the olympics obviously but i was absolutely challenged um during those times um and i mean obviously after the fact we, we want to make sure everybody's safe that that of course is that front of mind always but I think um, once you're in it, and it, it's just very emotional, it was it was tough to, within those first two weeks, kind of take the step back and see the bigger picture. But once there was a little bit more assurance that if the world was happening, it was it was it was going to be postponed. That kind of gave, gave a new clock and something to continue to look forward to. Yeah, it was, I'm sure, very relieving to know that it was a postponement and not a cancellation. And now that the games are clearly going ahead, um, we have made tremendous advancements in the COVID world, no question. More so down where you are now as compared to up north where uh, where we ex uh, resist. Um, I'm curious about the, is there still a little bit of trepidation about going or are you just full focused on the competition now and uh, achieving the ultimate goal of uh, stepping on the podium over there? Yeah, I mean, we're fully focused. I think... Um, as with any journey, there are going to be those distractions and things you can't control. And this is absolutely one of them. Um, we've created a bubble here. Um, we test We're. um, I was able to receive the first dose, dose of the vaccine, um, as a Florida resident. So I was incredibly excited about that. And I think, um, we've, we know a lot about Japan and they're, they have just this incredible attention to detail and they're so organized and and we have 100 percent confidence that they're going to create an environment in which we feel safe and and that we can compete to our best abilities but really it's about how we're living our dailies down here and we're doing the right things our team um, knows how important this is and and no one's willing to risk 
um, risk it, risk it for something, something small. So it's, uh, we definitely, we're leaning on each other. We have one another, but um, we trust that we're going to do the right thing. So it, it's, it's relieving knowing that we can just focus on ball. We have all the support that we need and, and we can really just use this time to continue to get better together. Amazing. I'm sure it's regardless of the uh, circumstances, it's going to be as it always is just uh, an incredible experience. So clearly uh, you feel very good about the chances of this team uh, stepping on top of the podium. Who poses the biggest threat to that in the uh, tournament? Um, I mean, the Japanese are, are one of the best in the business. So um, they're the reigning Olympic champions from a really long time ago, but the reigning champions. And um, they just seem to do things the right way. They work incredibly hard. They have the one of their fundamentals are unmatched and, and they play the game the right way. So I think them playing in their home kind of stadium in front of potentially their fans, we don't know what the fans will look like there, but um, they have one of the best pitchers in the world in Yuki Goeno and um, they've got a lot of momentum on their side. So um, we're more than up to the challenge. We're preparing for it every day. But I, I think um, Japan has uh, is definitely one to look out for. But truly, I mean, every single team going to the Olympics is elite. Like, this will be the most competitive Olympic Games we've ever seen for softball. And um, I'm so excited for that for our sport. Yeah, I know I speak for uh, for so many people hoping that the television coverage is there for softball. I know it's incredibly difficult to cover the Olympics. There's so many events, uh, so many things to, to cover, but we, we certainly hope we get to watch you guys uh, on a regular basis during the tournament because, like you said, the, the field is, is elite um, and our group is is the best it's ever been. So it's very, very exciting. Although this is the first Olympics uh, for you, Victoria, you've had lots of international experience, including two Pan Am Games. I'm always curious to know about um, international events like that where there's a ton of things going on outside your sport. Are you, are you just locked in and, uh, and thinking softball and nothing but, or do you really give yourself an opportunity to get out and experience the event and some of the other things going on around you? I think, yeah, I mean, Pan Am Games have been our kind of mini Olympics and obviously seeing those other sports, seeing some of the other athletes, but um, I think there's a fine balance. I mean, when we're there, it's a business trip. We're focused on ourselves. We want to win. We want to make sure we're 100% prepared and, and doing all the things we need to do, but we do have quite a bit of free time. So although we won't um, go to watch another competition necessarily just for the wear and tear that has on your body, we'll... We love um, spending time in the communal rooms and getting to know the other athletes and just sharing experiences at Canada House and, and sitting with other athletes and getting to know their stories. So we'll definitely have that social aspect, but um, really the focus is, is making sure that we're doing what we need to do first and, and then not getting too distracted because um, I'm glad we have a little bit of experience with going to a bigger event because so many people speak about um, – going to their first Olympics as kind of a, a trial run for their later experiences. And here we really have one shot. And so we don't have the time to go and let it be bigger than it is and, and uh, miss that opportunity. This is our one chance. And so um, we're going to be a hundred percent focused on ourselves. Do you have a favorite memory from the Pan Ams that you'd love to share? Um, man, to be honest, I don't remember my tw 2011 Pan Am Games was, I remember our opening ceremonies was pretty incredible, but it feels like such a long time ago. Um, in 2015, I missed it. I tore my ACL, so I unfortunately wasn't there when our team won gold, but I think everyone else would, would say that. That was a pretty incredible moment for our team. Um, and then in Lima, I mean, we had the opportunity, we played and beat Team USA, which was pretty special. Um, and just the community when you come back into like the Canada house and people know you played USA and they're so excited. Anytime you can, you can kind of beat the rival, but um, most of the fun moments are just um, getting to know those other athletes and sitting and watching different competitions on like a little beanbag chair with a cup of coffee before the game. So um, we keep it pretty low key. We did go get to see a game or two, but 
for the most part, we, uh, we just tried to lounge and get to know the other athletes and their stories and, and you can learn so much from them. Yeah. You mentioned 15 Victoria and I know <clears throat> just probably the most difficult experience of your, uh, professional career and, um, Talk about the intestinal fortitude you needed to get yourself through that event. Obviously, you you are so excited leading up, and you know it's at home. Your team is outstanding, and uh, the the torn ACL, and you have to miss it. Um, just speak about you know how you managed yourself through that that two week period. Yeah, I mean it was it was tough. It happened probably a month or two before the tournament, so um, I had already had surgery by the time it happened, but. I think I had been looking so forward to it. I mean, I'm originally from Toronto. That's where it was. We had family ready to go. My parents ended up going and, and watching some of the other events. Um, but, I mean, it was incredibly tough. I didn't watch the game. Um, I was a little too, I was a little drugged out from having surgery like the previous day or something like that. Um, but, it taught me just a lot about myself and what I wanted to do. I think I was definitely upset that I had felt like I was a big part of the team and then they went on and made history and I was just sitting at home on my couch. So I think it just caused me to kind of question what my role was, how I, what impact I was having on the team and just challenged me to want to be there for the next big moment. So I think I'm still playing on the team now because, part of me still wants to be a part of the, the next time Canada can make history, the next time we can do something great. And um, I mean, after reflection, I, I know I've helped mold things o- over the, over the course of that. But I think just sharing those moments with your teammates and kind of celebrating all of the work you've put in is, are, is one of the reasons why we play the sport, just to enjoy those moments with teammates. And so um, that definitely lights, lights my fire and uh, gets me going on some of those days where you don't necessarily want to. Absolutely. And you know what, as it turned out, uh, 19 turned into a pretty amazing experience and you got to, you know, get through and get that medal at that event. Um, Team Canada was so young uh, for you to get there as a 16 year old. Um, I want to talk about the recruiting process for college because obviously that impacted it hugely for you. Um, I represent you know, young Canadians that were, want to get recruited down south. Talk about um, how the, the fact that you were in the national event, national team at such a young age uh, in, impacted your recruiting process before you headed off to UW. So, I mean, UW had no interest in me before joining the national team. So I had I'd written to Coach Char before and, and never really received a response. But um, I always thought it was an amazing school. Um, my priorities, honestly, before joining the national team were 80% academic, 20% softball. So my focus was using softball to help me get into an incredible academic school. So I was looking East Coast. I went on visits to Princeton, Harvard, um, a few schools in California, but um, I had my heart set on Stanford. And that was when I, once I moved to California, that was my hometown team. It was what I thought the ultimate kind of combination of athletics and academics and it was right in my backyard. And so um, after I joined the national team, uh, Danielle and Jen were, had just won a national championship at Washington. They wanted me to come on a visit. And I was like, I, I really like Stanford. I'm, I'm feeling good about this decision. And um, a few months later, um, I applied to Stanford and, and something happened. And um, although I had checked all the boxes of what they needed for me, I, w- I wasn't accepted into the school, which was pretty crushing for me. But um, that led me to the University of Washington. And, and Jen and Danielle had said such great things about me. And Coach Char had seen me play that summer. So um, she had an opportunity for me. And um, it was the best decision that I ever made. So everything happens for a reason. I mean, in the moment I was absolutely crushed. I thought my dream, what I had thought, but, um, everything happened just as it should have. And it was, it was the best place for me to develop as a softball player and as a person. Yeah. I was going to say, obviously, uh, worked out pretty well for you in the end. Uh, obviously Victoria, you, you enjoyed massive success, uh, as a Husky, Tell our young, hopeful athletes about the amazing D1 experience, about, uh, you know, everything that goes along with playing D1 college sports, uh, and again, how it all came together at UW for you. 
Yeah, I mean, D1 sports are incredibly competitive and challenge you in every single way. Um, I had never experienced um, the consistent workload that we did at the University of Washington. So everything was structured. We um, practiced 20 hours a week, and then there was an expectation of doing individual work on top of that. So um, it was any it was more softball than I'd ever played before, but um, it just taught me the importance of culture and things that I would learn about studying the game. I think my – I, I had experienced a lot up to that point just competing, but and I was I was a I was a thinker as a player, um, but I think just kind of experiencing the more chalk talk side, the note taking side, the studying the game side in just team meetings and and that was a huge part of Coach Tar's development of players was really teaching and um, and she was an incredible teacher of the game so. I think I learned so much about the game, about myself in in those things that weren't necessarily mandatory. It wasn't during practice time. It was pursuing all of that after. And I think if you're wanting to be successful at the Division One level, a lot of your success is found in those hours that aren't mandatory. And if you don't love it, if you don't um, want to be there and want to push yourself and want to do it all on your own, um, it's just not going to be enough at that highest level. So I think those years taught me so much. And, and then coupled with being able to go put it into action with the national team every year. So I was playing softball uh, 12 months a year, every single year. And I think um, just that constant ability to learn and challenge, be challenged by some of the best players in the game and um, learn from a lot of people. Sometimes it was very overwhelming. It was not always easy um, having like three or four different coaches telling me different things, depending on what uniform I was wearing. But um, I look back now and I, I know so much more about myself and what I need to do to perform and play and, and, and now how to coach and help others that um, I wouldn't trade it for the world, but that work, work ethic piece and the balancing academics, I mean, they don't mess around in division one academics do come first and then you got to wake up early, work your butt off and uh, find a way to, to fit kind of 26 hours of work into 24 hours in a day. (laughs) Um, Your, uh, your four years were all incredible, but your senior year was beyond special. Um, Speak of the honor of being chosen as a first team, all American, uh, the selection process, how do you find out what's the aftermath? I mean, we hear it in all the sports, football, basketball, first team All-American, but when, when, you, when you hear the, that the news, how do you get told? And again, what's the process of being chosen as such an incredibly honoring position? Yeah, I mean, um, I remember at the beginning of my junior year, our assistant coach pulled me in. We had a team, we had a meeting uh, with the coaching staff and I, and he asked me what one of my goals was. And I said, I want to be an all American. It's it's what I want. It's what I've wanted for a really long time. Obviously we wanted to win a national championship that would always come first. um, But for an individual goal. And so he said, if you help this team get to the world series, you will be an all American. No, no doubt about it. And so that year I worked really hard. I, um, we had a great year. We ended up going to the world series and at the world series, the names were announced and I wasn't on it. And so um, I was a little bit crushed. The ego took a little hit, but we were still at the World Series. We wanted to win. We ended up coming third. It was an incredible year. And so I think in reflection of that, um, my next year's kind of motto was like, whatever I did before wasn't enough. I got my team there, but it wasn't enough. I need to be more. I need to do more. I need to help my team more. I need to be better in every single way. And so I think that was kind of always, the chip on my shoulder for that year. And, um, I worked harder than I ever had. I, um, challenged myself. I was, I asked my coaches to challenge me. And, um, then at the end of the year, I mean, I, the season was over. We had lost, um, my career was over, but I was just cleaning out my locker and, and got a, and got a message from uh, coach Char to come down. And she told me, and so, after that, I called my dad. We cried on the phone. It was incredible. Um, it was a great kind of way. I mean, my career was over. That still was like a jab to the heart, but I think it was just kind of a nice a nice way to say goodbye. And um, at UW, there's a wall where you're, you're 
there a picture of you gets to go and and um that was really special so every time I go back I get to see it but so that that truly is one of the most cherished um awards I've ever gotten but onward and upward now I want a medal now I'm ready for the next thing (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I think a medal hanging next to that would be pretty darn sweet for sure. Um, yeah, the next progression obviously became coaching for you. Was there a point while you were still playing in college that you knew coaching was on the horizon, or was it something that totally came up after you were done? I always did camps and clinics and really enjoyed teaching. Um, and my assistant coach, JT, he had been like, Vic, you'd be a great coach. I'm like, I'm not coaching. Lame. I thought it was lame. I wanted to go. I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I didn't want to coach. I knew that. Um, and then just kind of in that balancing piece of, of balancing how to find a way to continue playing, coaching was a logical avenue. And, and I initially pursued a graduate assistant position to try to complete more school. Um, so I completed my MBA. I started at LSU and then I finished at the University of Massachusetts where I was an assistant coach as well as a full-time student. Um, And then just really, I mean, I knew I enjoyed helping people and teaching people, but I really enjoyed the process of of just seeing people get better and and ended up truly loving it. Um, It was, it was a great, it was softball all the time. I love softball. I love helping people. I love hanging out at the field and, and listening to music and talking the game and all that stuff. So it was perfect for me for the time. Um, it definitely is not my forever position and, and I'm, but I'm so glad I experienced that. And it was honestly a vehicle to help people get better at softball and, and still gave me the opportunity to compete at the highest level and, and uh, continue playing as long as I have. Yeah. It's not as though you uh, chose a D3 Juco either for your coaching career. I mean, goodness, LSU, UMass, Maryland, and eventually uh, Central Florida, (laughs) pretty, pretty prominent schools in the world of NCAA sports. So how did, uh, how did that come about? The fact that you, you go again from the amazing playing career to these giant organizations for your first coaching opportunities. Uh, I mean, I, I, I just, I've met people through the game and um, I think the best part of our sport is the relationships you build through it. And um, at LSU, I was a graduate assistant. So I was able to learn from Beth Charina and um, her staff. I learned so much. It was incredible. And then it was, I was honestly empowered to like, Hey, I think I can go have even bigger role at a little bit of a smaller school. So that brought me to the university of Massachusetts. Um, my old teammate was coaching there at the time and they had a position open. So I joined her there and then, um, just constantly ready for new challenges. And, and I thought Maryland was a place that really aligned with things I value. It's a great academic institution as is UMass and, um, also has a super, an incredibly storied, um, athletics program. So it was an up and coming program that I thought I could help make an impact on and, and I honestly expected to stay there longer than a year, but um, then I was really just challenged with wanting wanting to be able to commit more of my time to training, just to really kind of see see the player I could become before the before our Olympic qualifier and before um, the Olympics. And so then UCF just became um, my old coach from my old assistant coach from the University of Washington got the head position there, and I knew I could help her build something special and and selfishly have access to all the things I needed and and, uh, continue to learn in kind of a different capacity. So um, it's honestly just been knowing great people and and just wanting to to help and make their programs better and and just bring what I've learned because I'm not coming up with any of this stuff on my own. Everything I know is borrowed from somebody at some point, and so I'm more than happy to share it. Yeah, you've mentioned a few names uh, <clears throat> over the course of the interview, Victoria. Thinking back on uh, some of the great coaches that you've had, what are the most important traits in your mind uh, that make a great coach? I mean, in my mind, a great coach, you just you lead with love and you lead with um, showing them the player that you believe that they can be. Um, I think... So often in sports, we want outcomes, we want execution, we want um, performance, we want performance. And um, 
as athletes specifically as females like when we believe when we think you believe in us and you have confidence in us and you trust us and all of those things our performance then goes through the roof um i don't have to perform to earn you you i earn trust every single day based on my actions and who i am and what i'm doing so that's truly been um something i've seen just players will outperform what they're supposed to and and teams will do it too if if they think you believe and and they see the potential and who they can become so i think um coach tar was definitely the first coach that really inspired me to be something more and and challenged me to to ne- not set a limit for the player i could be and so um I really, I really value Lonnie Alameda is another great coach that does that. Who's now involved with our program as a pitching coach, just people will limit themselves. And so as, as people who can help them get there, it's so important just to, to show them, show them what they could be if they, if they work hard and they're willing to, to do what it takes. What about recruiting strategy, Victoria? It's a, uh obviously a, a, a huge pool of talent all over America. Speak to some of our young Canadian hopefuls about what you would be looking for if you were in the recruiting world and certainly what some of the coaches are looking for. What are the key components outside of the obvious? Obviously, you light up the radar gun, you, you hit bombs, you run fast, but what are some of the intangibles that coaches look for when they're recruiting a young softball player? Um. I mean, something I think is totally undercoached in our game is base running. So if I see somebody making ba- great base running reads or getting crafty or exploiting another team's defense, um, I think that's incredible and something to look for. Um, I think so often it's flashy, um, and that's what catches people's eyes. But I think there is glory in, in doing something that's maybe not so flashy and just doing it really well consistently. So um and then just consistency in who they are as athletes i think um who you are in the dugout who you are with your parents when uh, maybe after a bad game or or in between games just hearing the chatter and all of those things i think are are really important to coaches because you spend so much time with one another that it's about the people and who they are and i think um every young canadian athlete that i've had the opportunity to kind of work with or, or coach it's people are like, wow, like she's really great or, or whatever. And that intangible, like personality, work ethic, Canadian grit, all that stuff. So uh, I always recommend just go get in front of the people you want to see you and, and show them who you are. Um, No video or, or single game can do that justice, but camps are so big to just show that you're willing to work, show that you're coachable, show that you um, are ready to learn and, and do whatever it takes for your coach. And, and show that you're uh, able to fail with grace. Obviously, that's a, a huge factor in that recruiting process. And certainly, to me, the most undervalued uh, trait of a team is chemistry. It's something that's uh, it's talked about, but how many teams truly have it? Uh, I think your Canadian national team clearly has it right now, so that's very exciting for you guys to be so tight, so uh, so amazingly close as you head over to this amazing event. Um, f- this is the part I've been most excited to talk about, uh, simply because in my interviews with Joey and Carissa, they couldn't say enough about Athletes Unlimited. I know you were uh, the first and certainly continue to be a, a huge leader of this program. Uh, take your time right now, Victoria, and give me the goods on Athletes Unlimited. Yeah, Athletes Unlimited, it's pretty incredible. So it's um, an, an organization of, of professional sports leagues for women. So uh, right now we stand at three sports currently and aim to grow to many more sports and potentially even dabble on the men's side with men's sports. But uh, it's completely just revolutionizing what we know as professional sports and, and how fans engage with their favorite players. So um, in November of 2019, I was, I got a call about going to learn more. So I flew up to New York with a few other softball players and, and heard this pitch. And um, I've been around the game for a few years and I've heard people wanting to pitch different leagues and have these ideas and, and it's all awesome for the sport, but 
the research and the investment that had already gone into what Athletes Unlimited was going to become. I mean, it was founded in market research and identifying what fans were doing now and, and just trends of what uh, consumers were doing. And, and I, w- I was shocked. I, I had no idea that I, I knew that it hadn't been done before, the model that they were suggesting, but I also knew that no one had the resources like Jonathan Soros and John Patrickoff had, our, our two founders. And so I went away from that meeting knowing that whether or not it was going to work or it was going to hit off, I knew it could be incredible and I knew I wanted to be a part of it. Um, so I think like two weeks after um, learning all about it and understanding it, I was offered a contract and signed it that day. Um, and then our long journey of kind of developing what the league would be began. So um, three, three other players and I really decided every single thing that was going to happen in the league with um, the help of Sherry Kempf, who was the MPF commissioner, our, our current our old professional league and had then moved over into a consulting role. So I began as a consultant for Athletes Unlimited, um, deciding how many people we wanted, what we wanted the structure to look like. Um, I mean, the general idea of certain number of people in a single place doing all of that had been decided, but um, rules we wanted to play with, who we wanted to be involved, the policies and procedures, we created it all and um, really had the ability to create something exactly the way we wanted it based on everything we'd learned from college and professional and international experience and, and just try to create something that was going to be consistent and provide more people opportunities to really experience life as a professional and um, give people something to aspire to be. So uh then COVID hit and things were going crazy but um sports started adapting the model that we already had so we were all systems go we never skipped a beat we were basically set up for a COVID world before you needed to be set up for a COVID world so um in that sense things were were relatively easy um but we really I mean I can't speak enough about the player group we had in that first season everyone was willing to sign up for something that they had no idea. I mean, we tried to pitch it, but even then we didn't know exactly what it would be like. We had this idea of what we wanted to be, but we couldn't guarantee anything or, but um, I mean, I was able to get great players like Carissa and Joey just because they trust me and who I am. And, and, and I was able to, to share the vision that we wanted to create with them. And so every single person in season one was so instrumental in creating AU to be exactly what it was that year. And, and we just finished an amazing volleyball season and we're about to embark on lacrosse in, in a month or two. But um, it was incredible. I mean, it was everything that all the softball community needed at the time. It was uplifting. It was empowering. It um, was bigger than just softball. And then on top of that, the quality of the softball was great and people got to know people that they'd never played again they never played with always against and it was just I think it was great for our softball community and I'm looking forward to continuing to build it so um, I am continuing to be the chairperson of our player executive committee so continuing to meet um, weekly about how we can improve um, what we like recruiting new players currently I'm working on um, a 2021 college draft of players that will be invited the next season of Athletes Unlimited um, and just continuing to to build it and um, it's challenging in so many ways uh, I have to put kind of my own preferences and and sometimes my own biases aside just to do what I think is best for the sport and for Athletes Unlimited so it's challenged me in a lot of ways but I'm so honored to be a part of it and to um, to play in season two and just to continue to provide more people with the opportunity and then of course, I mean, to meddle in it was just to win third place was like the storybook ending to just a crazy journey. I could not have written that better myself. Like it was one of the best days. Um, Danielle Laurie was calling the game. So she was there to celebrate it with me as well as Joey and Carissa and KJ. So it was incredibly special. And I mean, I don't know if any next season could live up to what season one was truly. It's something we'll never forget, but um 
yeah, it was it was incredible. Yeah, surely it's it, you know the the trajectory is to evolve it further and further. Um, as as the newest and, and or the first person to to sort of drive it forward, um, with the unknown in front of you, uh, the excitement of it all certainly. There had to be a charisma in John and Jonathan that just drew you right in, that you knew uh, these two guys had a vision and that uh, to make it athlete-driven, uh, everything about that, the, the way that it's done, <clears throat> it just was revolutionary to say the least. And uh, certainly those two gentlemen had to give you that sort of warm and fuzzy that they knew what they were doing and this was going to be something very big. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just the model itself is so selfless in that there were no owners and we were the owners. So in what other arena are our owners and people putting up the money, not the ones being like, this is how it's going to go. This is how I want to be. I mean, it's never been done in sports. So I think um, with that kind of mantra at the forefront, along with we're so cause driven as an organization of just wanting to do good in the world and wanting to help others and, um, enable people like me who probably couldn't um, support organizations charitably as much as I would want to, giving me the opportunity to, to contribute to causes I care about. And um, I mean, we have an, a pregnancy policy and a transgender policy that are unmatched by any other organization. So I think just who they are as humans and the mission that they set at the very beginning, we're so drawing to things that align with me and who I want to be and who the legacy I want to leave that, I would go through a wall for these guys. They're doing so much for us that the least I can do is 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 put my heart and soul in, into helping them build it. One of the, uh, the the coolest things about the previous athletes that I've spoken to about Athletes Unlimited is the incredible off-the-field success that uh, some of the athletes have enjoyed from starting businesses to evolving their businesses to uh, just clearly stepping up in the world as a direct result of their involvement with this program. And, you know, that can, that has to be the most exciting thing for you to recognize these athletes uh, taking their game beyond the field and uh, expanding their horizons just massively in the world. I think... In the game, we know how incredible some of the women in the game are. Um, we see them day in and day out. We know the things they're balancing. We know um, how much they have going on. And I think Athletes Unlimited was the first organization to really try to help push that forward and help um, kind of share with storytelling of, of who these people are and, and what they're doing. And uh, that was so empowering. And it just challenged people to think about what am I doing? What do I want to do? All those things. So I think um, so often that happens just within small teams and little conversations, but to happen with a group of 60 people all kind of in one, one collective team with um, people willing to help and wanting to provide resources for people to get the most out of the experience was, was definitely special. And now we're just trying to find ways to top it, but the prof the personal development thing stuff is, is so important and um, often so overlooked because it's just about what happens on the field. But as women, we're not paid enough to only focus on that. And so to have people invest in who we are off the field and who we are as humans was um, so special. And people felt that. And that's why they really loved it so much. Yeah, it's, uh, it's still new to me, um, checking into everything that is Athletes Unlimited. But I have completely fallen in love with this program. Uh, I follow every post that comes out on LinkedIn and all the different social medias. And uh, I wish I could get more uh, television coverage up in Canada. I know it's evolving with the streaming and such, but uh, hopefully we'll get to a point where uh, it'll, it'll get on mainstream TV because uh, the game that you play – uh, and and is so undercovered in this country. Uh, and again, whenever I am able to travel to the states, and if it's during regionals or such, and ESPN does such a great job. They have a, a awesome coverage of all the softball around the country, and it's just amazing to watch on television. So I hope this country gets on board with it. Um, you know, we need to we need to have some softball on TV up in Canada. Absolutely. Sure. And I mean, we're working on making it more accessible. So whether it's YouTube or streaming, a global streaming service, I mean, 
that's also part of our responsibility to make it accessible when people are going to watch because people love it when it's on, man. They really do. Yeah. No question about it. <clears throat> Everyone I've spoken to, uh, Victoria, has mentioned you as someone that has impacted their life. That's got to make you feel incredibly proud and good. But I'm curious, who has impacted Victoria Hayward? Who are your your mentors? Who are the, the people that have kind of pushed you to where you are today? I mean, I've had some pretty... I mean, my parents, first and foremost, are... 100% the reason why I'm here um, in, di in different ways. They challenge me all the time, but in terms of softball specifically, I mean, coach Tar was huge in my development. Um, she taught me so much about the game, about myself. Um, and then just more recently, I mean, people I've met through athletes unlimited have a huge impact on my life. Um, Lauren Lappin was one of my favorite players growing up and I had the opportunity to learn from her um, and really pick her brain. She was, she was a two-time Olympian with team USA and, um, sharing her experiences and who she is. She's had a huge impact on me. Some of the, the players within the league, Hannah Flippin, Gwen Speckus helped me build athletes unlimited and it's become someone I rely on immensely. And, um, Kaylee Rafter, uh, as a member of this team has, has helped me through so much stuff. I mean, she's, She's my kind of North star sometimes when I, when I don't feel like I have things together and, and she's someone I rely on constantly um, for just a nudge in the right direction or, or just someone, someone to, to air my thoughts out to. So I've been incredibly lucky to, to have so many people in just different facets of my life help me during some different times. But um, I definitely, I'm glad I can make an impact, but so many people help me just even even do that too well as i mentioned uh, everyone that i've had the pleasure to speak with uh, that know you uh, clearly see you as uh, somebody that has impacted their lives in a great and wonderful way um, you are on the precipice of something that uh, very few ever get to experience the olympic games are just around the corner uh, you're training your butts off down there, and I think I speak for all Canadians uh, saying I hope we get to see you on top of the podium singing O Canada arm in arm. Uh, it'll be a teary moment for all of us. I, I couldn't be more excited to watch softball than I am for this Olympic Games. Uh, Victoria, I cannot uh, possibly thank you enough for coming on during this incredibly busy time in your life. Um, we wish you the best of success, and again, uh, I am honored that you stopped by with Talking Ball with Bex. Thank you so much. This has been an awesome conversation. These fill my bucket, too, so thank you for, for having me and letting me share a little bit of who I am, but I love your podcast and everything you're doing for the sport. Thank you so much. Have, a uh, again, a great last of your training, and uh, good luck over in Tokyo. Okay, take care. Every time we come to the end of one of these things, I just have to pinch myself to truly understand the magnitude of the guests we're having on this show. Today, again, no exception. Up and coming future star Paige Simpson from St. Joe's Academy and the Red Deer Rage. Current D1 softball star Ryan Milliken from Lambrick Park in Victoria. And of course... How could we forget the captain of Team Canada on their way to Tokyo to bring home the gold, Victoria Hayward. Thank you to all three of them for stopping by once again and making it another incredible episode of Talking Ball with Bex. Next week, again, we're doing it big. We're going Area Scouts. We are doing the launch of Area Scouts Canada. Join Lance Baldwin, Brian Murray, Fred McGriff, uh, Joey Lai, Alyssa Reyna. The list goes on and on, and it is happening right here next week, Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern, 3 in the mountains. You're talking ball with Bex from Gap to Gap and Coast to Coast. We'll see you next week. Thanks a lot for stopping by.